Hello, Vector Podcast is here. And today we're going to be talking to the author of HNSW uh, library um, and algorithm. It's one of the best uh, algorithms out there, one of the most used algorithms in vector search. And today I'm talking to Yuri Malkov. Hi, Yuri. How are you doing? Hi. Hi. Good. Uh, so, yeah, uh, my name is Yuri Malkov. Uh, currently, I'm working at Twitter uh, as a staff ML engineer, and I'm doing content understanding and uh, research and recommender systems. Yeah, please know that during discussion, I don't represent like uh, Twitter's point of view. Uh, the views are of my own. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you, you already began introducing yourself. So I was wondering if you could tell me a, a bit about yourself, uh, your background, and um, then maybe we can also move into discussing the algorithm itself. Okay, sure. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, my, my tra trajectory of moving to ML is uh, quite typical to Russia. So yeah, I got like good physics education in uh, Nizhny Novgorod, and there I did the PhD in laser physics. So there I was doing experiments with uh, on terawatt lasers. So uh, that was fun, and like that part of physics is like considered to be like sexy part, similar to computer vision. Uh, in machine learning and uh, I was lucky to have good supervisors so one of my uh, supervisor which was like mostly a supervisor of paper so he helped me is now the, the head of Russian academy so yeah I had I had good supervisors and in addition to physics uh, I was concurrently working part-time uh, in a startup that was building distributed uh, scalable search systems uh, based on insights from real networks. Uh, yeah, that work ended up in several papers on predecessor or of HNSW. Uh, and the startup, uh, yeah, and the, unfortunately, the startup was closed uh, before even I got PhD. So, uh, yeah, and I decided to focus on physics after that, uh, but after like, I got my PhD degree in physics. Uh, so I, like there, there was a choice for me, like what to do next and uh, to, uh, in, to proceed with career in physics, I had to go abroad. At, like I didn't want to go abroad. I want to stay in Nizhny Novgorod. Uh, so I decided to just like switch directions and do network science there. Uh, and I got a really good grant from uh, like Russian fund, RFFE, which now is not present anymore. Uh, so I could do like research by my own, like this pretty good salary. And uh, yeah, I also joined companies, like computer vision companies to, get the insight of why like people actually use like similarity search algorithm and machine learning. And I worked uh, at on television and later anti club, which is the company that, that is like doing big brother for Moscow, like Moscow surveillance. And later I uh, joined Samsung AI center in Moscow. And there I worked with uh, Viktor Lempitsky, who is one of the well-known personas in Russia, NML. And uh, in 2019, I moved to US, and now I work in Twitter doing recommender systems and uh, content understanding, like BERT models. Oh, yeah. So you probably also use nearest neighbor search in your work, or? Well, uh... Uh, you, not really. Can, I'm. You can mention it. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, not really. So I'm focused on the. Uh, so I can work Twitter. Uh, well, mo most of the time, I can last uh, half a year. Yeah, I spent on improving search relevance. So the, that that is mostly the ranker. But that that is closely related to uh, the nearest neighbor search. 
yeah yeah so so you mentioned like basically the background where you've been in russia it was like kind of related to computer vision of course you had physics back background by education but you also kind of worked in computer vision startups so what was your impression of this nearest neighbor search problem and like how did how did you think about it when like did you read papers to understand like what was done in that area i think that area is pretty like developed right in 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 um in the papers like uh, like nsw itself right uh, like navigation uh, world well so uh like in the startup mera labs uh, i have been work have been working i think at work for six or seven years so uh it was quite quite a significant like period of time and there we started just like from distributed search so the idea was like we, we do it from scratch so like we don't care what have been done before so we have an idea so there are like distributed hash tables like port or other stuff and uh, we want to do it but with similarity search so uh, that should scale to petabytes and there that's like a very different approach from nearest neighbor search and uh, like most of the time we spent like developing this algorithm was not even like nearest neighbor search that was uh, closer to this symbolic filtering but with uh, like arbitrary filters mm -hmm. uh, and only at some point of time like we had a realization that oh like that is similar to what people actually need like there are a lot of papers of on nearest neighbor search so we yeah switch direction and pub and like the the most cited publications are on nearest neighbor search yeah yeah i don't remember was it on your paper or somebody else's paper as i saw a paper of my old friend yuri lifshitz because he actually defended his thesis like in phd thesis in this uh, space so he when he was doing it i think it was 2009 i was like i was considering this like a pure mathematical problem without like maybe direct application but then he gave a, a talk at google like you know google tech talks i don't know if they still exist or not but like he presented this this problem and like they did some optimizations as well um and then i think i think your paper cites it or maybe someone else's i don't remember i was like really surprised to see you know his his work also kind of in the same line of of things that now lead to vector search essentially well yeah i think i saw his work but it seemed like yeah like more theory like if you if you look to history like of uh like graph approaches so uh, like uh now it's mostly like rehashing of old stuff so like uh, definitely there are new things but uh like there is so much work done before like sergey brin worked on the uh, nearest neighbor search with uh, like gnat so that is also like a good work there was there were previous work on graph search i think in 1993 which uh, like aren't that much different compared to uh like current no like they have also problems with scalability uh, at that point so i think uh, yeah so that there was uh, the, there is a like a large number of like previous work uh, yeah. in that area yeah but but you said like you didn't um concern yourself with reading too many papers before you started inventing this new algorithm is that right yeah sure sure well like we read papers but they were not really relevant so we read papers on uh on network science and uh so we tried to so there, there was a problem with building like this no navigable small worlds so like not every small world network is navigable uh like uh, most models are not so we wanted to build navigable small and uh, there we also didn't didn't understand like uh what uh what was the criteria like what is like how we could make it and we we reinvented the like this uh, uh Dillanoi graphs inside the company and after like you reinvented you, like you're now starting to search and see there are lots of papers who did the same right yeah, yeah. So, so yeah so we went the, the other way and 
yeah to reinvent stuff so now that you mentioned this thing like can you actually please introduce this concept at least on high level to our audience like what is a small world what is like why, why it needs to be navigable kind of a little bit like uh um, more to the user facing <laughs> level uh, if it's possible mm -hmm. well uh like navigable small world so you have a large network uh and uh so navigable small world, that means you can find uh, paths uh, between like arbitrary elements in this network uh, uh, using, which is a logarithmic uh, scale. So the number of uh, hops can be done logarithmic and uh, uh, you can use only local information. So you can do like something like greedy search. Like greedy search is uh, allowed. And if you can find uh, like the, the path in logarithmic steps, your, your network is navigable. Mm -hmm. and, and and that small world part, like why is it small? Small? Uh, well, that's uh, like historic for well, his historical reason. So there was like a famous uh, like Milgram experiment uh, where uh, they, they they sent letters from uh, one person, like from random person to some target person. Uh, that that was kind of greedy, like greedy search via connections, so very similar to this and uh, that that's called like small world experiment so like it's mm -hmm. a small world so in uh, real networks uh, like people have like real networks ha have low diameter like human uh, human connection networks and uh, they are navigable like uh, at least according to milgram experiments and uh, like subsequent experiments Right. similar to that is it kind of related in common terms like to six handshakes that you need to connect every random person with another random person on the planet yes yes so that that's the like that experiment is pretty old i think it's done in the 60s so mm -hmm. yeah so and yeah, so that, that... yeah and and so the navigable part is basically like if we put this in the context of search right so um so let, let's say I have local information, I'm here. I would like to travel from here. Let's say I'm in Helsinki, I would like to travel to New York. Like how do I travel, right? I need to go to the airport. From the airport, I will travel maybe to some city in Europe. From there, I will change, you know, the airplane and then fly over to New York. I, I may, I'm making it, it a little bit more complicated. There is a direct flight to New York from Helsinki, but okay, maybe there wasn't, right? Is that analogous to navigable part? Uh, yes, yes. So, well, like generally, like that, that, you can pinpoint that. But if you start and finish in like small local airports, which usually don't have connections, not much connection, so they're connected to hubs. Yeah, and that is one of the model of navigable small worlds. So there are like Kleinberg's model, which doesn't have hubs. So you can also build navigable small worlds without hubs. But uh, they have they have polylogarithmic scalability with, uh, with mm -hmm. the network. Mm -hmm. So okay. if you want to have logarithmic scalability, so you, you, yeah, so you need to have hubs. Yeah, M maybe I'll I'll ask you to provide some references later. So especially for those who want to dig deeper into this mathematics, like uh, it, like you you mentioned these different algorithms, like many of them are new to me at least. So I'm sure to our part of our audience as well. Um, and and I wanted to also also ask you like on the context of your invention, like what was the input? So you said like you had a lot of data, right, from computer vision, but like was there something else like dimensionality or some other constraint that was kind of tough for previous algorithms like LSH or you know any other well uh that LSH didn't even work so we worked with uh, like tree structure so you have to like how 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 how, how will you do LSH yeah for and for LSH so I thought that those are not practical algorithms so even when i sp spoke with people who like were writing a lot of papers on lsh they like expressed doubts in whether those algorithms are practical so they, they are not learnable so they cannot take advantage of the data that you have so like that and like what what they told is like they see as quantization as just a better version of a practical version of lsh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And so actually, I'm really interested, like, how did you set up 
to invent the algorithm. Like I, I can just give you briefly, like uh, in the recent billion scale uh, vector search challenge, uh, we, we had like a small team and uh, one of our team members actually Im implemented like a small change in pro product quantization layer. Like basically how you shuffle the, the dimensions in the vector and he achieved like 12% uh, recall increase over the baseline, you know, the Facebook's algorithm. I, I didn't like have that much, much knowledge. I've read your paper, I've read other papers. And so I was just thinking, okay, if I, if I would start from first principles, how would I solve it? Like, I, I know nothing about this problem, right? So like, how can I solve, you know, the search in multidimensional space? And so I actually implemented a very, very simple algorithm using your uh, algorithm as one of the components. Maybe we can talk later about it, but like, how, how did you start inventing HNSW? Uh, well, HNSW had a predecessor. So it has uh, like N NSW, it's also called MSW or SW graph in different places, like depending on where you look. So, uh, and uh, there I just, uh, so it had problems, so, it has several problems, but uh, like for, for uh, like if you don't think about distributed setup, the main problem it had uh, poly logarithmic scalability with a number of elements and that killed the performance on low dimensional data. So there were like comparison works, like one by Leonid Baitsov, uh, where he evaluated different algorithms and uh, like its performance really like it didn't perform that well on uh, some data set. And the loss was by many orders of magnitude. So it could be like one, like 1000 times slower than the, the best solution. And uh, yeah, so the work on HNSW were uh, targeted at just improving the previous version so it wouldn't have this problem and like ideally would perform the best on all setups mm -hmm. so yeah and that 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 has been solved right but like you still needed to add that magical h in front of it so you made it hierarchical like what 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 pushed you in the direction of making it hierarchical and what 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 did you think that it might work or was it like as a result of experimentation that it proved to work uh well uh yeah that that, that that's that's uh, yeah, that, that has many ingredients in it. So for, sh for, for one thing, uh, when I worked with the startup Mera Labs, uh, so we had a different problem with distributed index that uh, NSW had uh, unpleasant quality that uh, uh, the hubs uh, that are created in the network are the first elements. So, and uh, for distributed system, you would want to add new nodes uh, to the system and the, uh, it will have much capacity, like increase the capacity of the system. But because all your hubs are in the first nodes, like in the older nodes, because they have been created uh, before new nodes even existed. So all traffic is routed through the same old nodes, uh, which make it not scalable. And uh, we spent quite a lot of time on figuring out how to solve it. And there at some point I've noticed that like our NSW approach is pretty similar to skip list in terms of uh, what, what what has been what is being produced as final network. So if you the idea is like if you if you create a skip list for one D and create a NSW for one D and then like for skip list you just merge the uh, all all links uh, regardless of layer you will get a similar network in terms of like degree distribution like distance distribution, well, all major properties. So, but the uh, skip list doesn't have this property. So you can add new nodes and they can have like, they can have higher levels and uh, like your traffic will be routed through nodes uh, uniformly across your distributed system. So, and, and that thing we knew like from the startup that there is a like equivalence, but that was only for the problem of distributed search. So mm -hmm. it would still use the same polylogarithmic L, like uh, greedy search algorithm, like which doesn't think about uh, uh, like what is that, uh, how, how many links you have on a node. 
Uh, so that was shelved for, for that reason since the startup. Uh, but then, uh, so after I did PhD, so like I, I wanted to publish a good paper on network science. Uh, and the, there, like it was a, a and I like the, the, the result that we can create a new navigable uh, networks, which a method which was not known before. So I tried to publish it in nature. So it was rejected, like nature physics also rejected. It was rejected by editors. Then in uh, scientific reports, it was rejected after a review. And then like it was finally published in PLOS One. Um, and I think like, I really liked this paper. So that was like the most surprising result I think I got. But uh, yeah, it's not really decided. And as a byproduct of this, I did a comparison to other navigable small world uh, methods. Uh, and so like, maybe I thought maybe like, this approach with like the old vision that uh, you can apply, like you can look at the uh, real world networks and replicate it in, like, in computer system and they will be efficient. So I replicated the worked on like scale free navigable, navigable small worlds, which are very popular, I think, till the moment. So, uh, and, uh, and so that the like, great performance like really it was like very bad, like extremely bad. And the reason for that, that uh, if you have a scale-free network and scale-free means you have a, a power law distribution of degree. And usually they like they, there is a coefficient gamma and like they see the best case is this gamma is close to two. But gamma close to two means that the scalability with the size of the network. So the degree scales almost linearly. So when you have a, a like a greedy search through uh, the hub, so when it goes through the hub, like it evaluates like a huge portion of the network. So you have like linear scalability instead of like uh, ultra logarithmic, so log log n, which they like the number of hops is log log n. But at some point you will evaluate to ev like almost every point in your network and you have like really bad performance. And that like that after that, uh, I realized what was the problem with NSW. And like, I, I thought, oh, like we already have a solution for that. So because skip list doesn't have this problem. And uh, so yeah, after that I implemented the prototype and it worked and then started working on the, the like C++ version and the uh, evaluation. Mm -hmm. By the way, when, when you started implementing your prototype, was it initially in C++? No, it wasn't in, 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 in Java. In Java, because Java is uh, your favorite language, or why why was it Java? Uh, because uh, the like the distributed system like that work was implemented in Java. So ah, okay, uh, so it was, clo was close. So like it was easier to integrate. Like if you like maybe you were thinking it's easier to integrate in in Java, right? Well, I just know how to code it in Java, so I okay. coded it several times uh, for NSW. And uh, the uh, old Java code was released. Uh, so yeah, I just called it and then like I had to transfer it to C++ to, to make it efficient. Uh, and, and like, uh, yeah, and uh, so there is uh, like Leonid Baitsov, so who, who, who is a maintainer of NMS Lib. So I have been in contact with him for quite a while. And uh, yeah, so. It was implemented in this library. Mm -hmm. did, did you like uh, collaborate uh, with him to 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 implement it using Anima Sleep, sort of the most efficient way? Or well, uh, first of all, like the ideology of the library is very close to uh, like what we have been developing. So it's not only focused on like typical distances, like L two cosine or like even even like inner product. Uh, so yeah, it makes sense to compare on all those uh, distances. And uh, Leonid also had a paper, uh, like in a uh, in a bench, like on all of those. So we can just implement a new algorithm and run a bench. Right. And so that that was like a really good point. And it also was in, uh, implemented in uh, and benchmark. So if we add uh, an algorithm, so we can like go through all sets of benchmarks. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like it was kind of easy for you to evaluate where your algorithm stands against other algorithms, right? So like yes, right, right. And, and so what was the and you also had a co-author, right? Maybe maybe you could introduce him as well, like um, on, on your paper. Oh uh, yeah, that 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 is Dmitry Yashunin. So uh, so that that's that 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 was my peer uh, in the like physics labs. He also got PhD the same year I did. So uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so we decided to team up with that. So he helped a lot, and he he did he did the all evaluation. So he integrated it with other code. Uh, and he ran the evaluation on the like clusters that we had. Yeah. At that point. Nice. So, so back to the invention, like as you've been inventing this algo, did you have to make a lot of adjustments to the core of the algorithm as you have been evaluating it? Or was it like, you know, the first shot and it was it? Uh, well, not really. So there are like two uh, changes compared to NSW uh, in HNSW. So uh, first one is the idea of layers. So that solved most of the problems with uh, like low dimensional data and uh, yeah, also improved performance uh, like in most of the tax, that like most of the distributions, even like, but maybe not much at like high dimensional data. Uh, but uh, still, when I ran the full like suit, uh, there was a there was a few data set on on which it performed worse compared to VP3. So that's from Leonid suit, and uh, I thought that wasn't a big deal. But uh, like I com communicated the results with Leonid, trying to convince him that like we don't need to have like that much algorithms. Uh, but he was not convinced. So uh, then we added like uh, an improvement uh, with the heuristic for selecting the neighbors, which uh, like I personally knew from the work on spatial uh, approximation tree, uh, and uh, that 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 made like the uh, that made the transition to skip list uh, exact. So it made an exact. So you can build the exact skip list in one D using this heuristic. And after that, so yeah, that, 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 that additionally improved the performance. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If I remember, please correct me if I'm wrong, but like I've read your paper actually really, really closely. So I printed it and, you know, like I was reading with the pencil actually making notes. So I remember like at some point, was it so that your algorithm, it also needs to prove that it will converge? Or, or like, because you keep reshuffling the points in some way, right? Like as you build it, you use multiple threads like in order to kind of build the the actual paths between the nodes between layers right so like mm -hmm. do, do you need to kind of uh still somehow make sure that it will converge on all uh dimensionalities on all spaces or or was it was it not necessary uh well so the algorithm the, the algorithm is pretty stable so the, the result with like how many threads you can go, that is an empirical result. So I was surprised so when, I, when I saw it, but uh, you know, even like for NSW, the first algorithm, even if you start to do like to use, I don't know, 40 threads from a single element, like I found no, no, no drop in recall or speed. So that was a bit surprising. Uh, in terms of stability, uh, so the main way to make it stable is just like to avoid avoid exploding. So like use use proper parameters big enough. There are ways to make it stable in, in uh, for corruption. So and when, but that 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 is pretty costly. So if you bootstrap the graph, so if you like do iterations like similar to an end descent, I think you probably know that uh, you can make it stable uh, even if it's corrupted by a lot mm -hmm. so, and that is uh, done only for updates so like when you update you are kind of corrupting the graph and uh, well in the like hnsw lib uh, 
so uh, for updates, it wasn't specifically made to be like very stable. But for just construction, it doesn't have to be like that stable. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to conversion all situation. You just keep the parameters yeah. high enough and it wouldn't diverge. Right, yeah. Because I remember like, um, and I, I'm also curious to, to hear your opinion. Uh, so then I, after your paper, I, I started reading other papers for example, the Microsoft's Zoom algorithm, and then later uh, they called it DiskNN with some modifications. So they were comparing to HNSW at larger scale, something like billions of um, nodes, bi billions of uh, points in the space, right? And so they, they were trying to minimize the cost that, that, that it will incur because basically uh, as you build the HNSW, you also use memory quite a bit right so um I, I wanted to hear your opinion on that part and then they what they did is that they i don't know if you're familiar with these papers but what they did is that they offloaded portion of the retrieval to to an ssd disk and so they kind of combined your algorithm with like additional layers and then they kind of resolve to full precision when they go to ssd disk but they don't don't do it in memory Mm -hmm. So they do use quantization, right? Yeah, yeah, they use quantization exactly. Oh, that, that that's a very popular approach, and that makes sense. So it's a, mm, so basically you have a hardware limitation, so that you can cannot store with. You have a high hardware hierarchy, so you have like not so big RAM and like lots of SSDs, and maybe like if you have a distributed system, you have access to other nodes. Uh, so yeah, that's a clever use of hierarchy that makes sense mm -hmm. but at the same time like your algorithm was taken into use into popular frameworks like files right so like files is not a single algorithm like one of them is hnsw and then um i actually don't know how they did it did they take your c plus plus dependency directly or did they re-implement it do you know yeah they, they re-implemented from scratch so uh like i talked to them once so they said they tried different way, but like in the end, it was uh, like pretty close to the uh, like the initial C plus plus library. Though they have some diff so there is some some things are implemented differently in FIS. So for instance, there is a thread pool uh, like in HNSW lib for keeping track of visited elements. So when you have a new search, uh, it, there is a like a, a map, uh, like can think of a bit map for which nodes, which nodes in the network are visited. And the HNSW, it's kept in memory all the time. And when you have like a new search, it will just like picks from the pool. And then FAIS, uh, like it creates it once per search. So their batch search is more, more effective. Yeah. To... Yeah, yeah, batch search. Yeah, batch search is another feature that sometimes is implemented in vector databases. But did, did you like um expect that your algorithm would become so widely applicable like do, do you know that it has been re-implemented in several languages like for example as part of vector database called v aviate it was implemented in go and then there is a database called quadrant it it's implemented in rust um and of course all of these implementations also add like crud support so they you can actually update right because in reality in database you need these features um and then uh, they also added symbolic filtering on top of that so it's also inside your algorithm like did, did you um did you expect such popularity uh no no like i thought that we will publish the algorithm and like we will win the benchmarks and we are clearly seeing Although at that time, like uh, just before we published the benchmark, there was a like competitor Falcon, which also published the benchmark. So we did better, but like for Falcon targeted, like not like that much. And I thought that, uh, well, Falcon was only like for few specific metrics. And uh, yeah, actually, yeah, it also was done by uh, like a person from uh, the same school which I went, so it was Ilya Rosenstein. So I talked with him a bit. Uh, and I thought that like we have, we open source the code. So we published the paper. So like people will quickly just like iterate on top of that and uh, like improve further. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so it took much more time 
to others to like improve upon it compared to what I've expected. And uh, maybe that was uh, due to lack of interest. Maybe that was to some inertia. So uh, I, I, I don't know, like looking at the how many startups and solutions are popping out right now, it seems like that uh, like the most of the interest came much longer, like much later. Yeah. Uh, to like to the point when it was released. So it was hard to predict it back then. Yeah. Do, do you think that uh, Enema Sleep has to do something with this success that it kind of maybe Enema Sleep was somewhat visible and then when you edit your algorithm there and showed that it performs you know those people who followed this library at least knew okay there is a new algorithm uh i think uh, yeah well that helps so when the sleep like is a good library so it had has some audience i think uh the most uh, like attention came from n and benchmarks so because uh yeah, well, Annoy is uh, like what was had a lot of attention by that point, and uh, that benchmark was uh, done by uh, the same person uh, yeah. who did Annoy. So yeah, I think that uh, mm, that drove some like traffic to mm -hmm. uh, the libraries, and yeah, also I think the idea of algorithm was like understandable and uh, so. So that, 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 that also like affects the usage. So if you understand something, you are more likely to use it. Yeah, yeah. It's Eric Ber Bernardson, right? The yeah. Swedish, Swedish guy, as he says, the Swede who is stuck in New York City. Yeah, I think he, he implemented Annoy originally. There is also like um, a presentation by him uh, where he explains not only the Annoy algorithm, but also... Uh, how our intuition doesn't work in in multi-dimensional spaces anymore like we think that like in three in 3d world where we live now right like the further the point away from you like you can actually see it somehow perceive it but like in in multi in high dimensional space it's not like that i don't know what's your view on that by the way like does geometry yeah. perception changes in in high dimensional space uh, well, yes, yes. So there are like many interpretations of this. So people who work with uh, like nearest neighbor search, they uh, know about it. So like if you have like if you have like many dimensions, even small perturbations there, they can go like far. Uh, so you will have like so to find nearest neighbor, you need to have like a huge covered sphere. Yeah, uh, like when you divide divide the space, so yeah, that makes the problem complicated, and and that that is one of the reasons why uh, all the practical me methods are approximate. Right. Yeah. 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 So like you do, you do need some approximation in order to find uh, the points, and so yeah, I mean it sounds like so so when you um, when you mentioned N N benchmarks. Was it you who submitted the algorithm for the benchmarks or was it Eric who picked it up and he made it uh, kind of available in the NN benchmarks? Uh, no, no, no. I did a pull request to edit. All right. So it but, basically, yeah, yeah. So you pushed it forward yourself, right? So it wasn't like you just implemented and then you waited for it to be discovered, <laughs> so to say. No, no. Yeah, def definitely. So like the one of the like... Uh, decisions to use an MS sleep was uh, that NMS sleep was already integrated in a benchmark so I think that will be just like adding some code in a benchmark that like pulls this algorithm and uh, like and the tuning of the parameters so that was but that was simple to do right yeah and and so as you did that like what were the results like of that and of course NN benchmarks it has a number of parameters right for example like even indexing speed uh, not only like recall um, versus qps trade trade off like was there sp some specific kind of metrics that where hnsw excelled over other algorithms uh well at that point of time there was uh, like no uh, logging of the construction time and memory consumption and uh, the like the initial version in, in the must sleep it had like clear focus on the 
performance uh, like recall to speed ratio. Uh, yeah, and uh, well, you know, it's hard to do proper benchmarking. So like there are a number of scenarios somewhere you have a limit on memory. Uh, somewhere you have a limit on the construction time. So sometimes like you don't care about them at all. You just care about the speed. You can also care about like multi-threaded performance or you can care about like single-threaded performance, like maybe different scenarios. So it's pretty hard to do proper benchmarking. And uh, there, like, uh, like I did a decision to just focus on the recall and don't mm -hmm. think about construction and memory at okay. all. I see. Yeah. And so, and, and basically when you, when you did that, like was HNSW like at the top of the competition at that point? Yes. Yes. It was like a top and on, uh, many, many benchmarks. It was like, there's a huge gap compared to the next competitor. So not so maybe for, uh, globe, I think with Falcon, there was still there, there was a like significant uh difference uh yeah but on many yeah also like uh at some point after that there was a re-release re of k-graph algorithm so the which like decreased the, the the difference but it was still on top of it yeah so did, did you did you did did it make you feel proud at that moment when you saw the big gap and like this is your invention or how did you feel about it well, uh, that that felt nice for sure. So, uh, so, yeah. So we we published the paper. I think like pub when the paper was finally accepted. So it it also felt like really well. So I think it took uh, like two and a half years to publish the paper. Wow. As as they say in the U.S., I think every rejection brings you closer to the goal. So it sounds like. You've been injected in in multiple like journals. No, then, then no, it was no. then it was still published. <laughs> no, that was a single journal. It's just okay. like yeah. yeah, one revision took one year. So that right. is that, that is PAMI. So transaction of pattern analyzing and machine intelligence. Ah, okay. Uh, so like we follow the practice and physics and ignore ignore the conferences. So and we also need a. For the grants, we need to have journal publications, not not conference publications. So we sent to PAMI, and uh, it had few revisions there, uh, but each revision took a year. Wow, this is super long. Why do you think it was like that? Like why why would reviewers be so scrutinizing like your submission? Well, I I, I don't know. So like I actually I talked with. Uh, uh with the editor so i was very angry after after <laughs> the first result uh so and uh it seems like uh, just a problem is how uh publications in computer science are organized so that's uh that's not only that journal there are so many journals which have this problem and uh like when i looked at twitter like when some discussions there were like oh i got uh like uh, review invitation for like this like PNAS journal. Uh, and uh, they said I have to write review in 10 days. Oh, I never gonna do that. So no, like no way I'm writing a review in 10 days. And uh, yeah, so in, in physics, it, took, it sometimes took a few weeks to get the review in the journal, in journal. So you send that and like if it's months, you can already start like writing to review like what 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 takes so long yeah and uh yeah in computer science uh, uh journals are very slow conferences are also slow there's are uh, several months to get the review and like people solve it via using archive yeah so like if, if there were no archive i think they they have already like they would just give up redo this yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they will create new journals yeah so then exactly uh, which like there, there should be any monopolies right in that sense like maybe go and create your own journal but then the question is when when the problem is when you're a phd student let's say you have a chicken egg problem right so you haven't proven yourself yet you need a publication to defend your thesis right <laughs> so that's the trap <laughs> well like it's, it's also known how 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 can this solve? So if like they created like a new conference, conferences like I think I don't remember ICLR or ICML, 
was, was created not that long ago. They could have created a journal as well. So yeah. The same people said, like, we don't want to do conferences. Like, conferences, you have a very tight deadline. That means, like, if you miss it, you, you wait for another year. And that is, like, not, not great. Let's, let's create a journal. And now you have a continuous, like, spectrum of time when you want to uh, send your paper, no deadlines. There are no deadlines for reviewers. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you could almost review yourself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, uh, du du during the review period on the conference, you can get, like, 10 papers at the same time. So you need to review them, like, in, in a batch. But if you are working with journals, you get review, like, from time to time. Yeah. And, like, your, your, your load is distributed. Yeah. So, by the way, what is your take? Like, I think New IPS conference, they uh, decided this year, they decided to hold all reviews publicly. So essentially anybody can see, you know, the comments from re reviewers and there is like a discussion between reviewers and authors and everything is public. Do you think it improves the process somehow or not? Or what, what's your take on this? Well, I think that makes sense. So uh, that opens... Uh, well, that, that sets the bar, bar for reviewers higher because if you know that your review will be read by some random people, you want to make it better and spend more time on reading the paper. It also helps uh, to understand the review process from outside. Like for if you're a new reviewer, you want to understand like how to do a proper review, you can just read reviews by other people. And that is helpful. And you, you can also... Like if if you're if you want to publish a paper, you can find similar papers and read the reviews for those papers and understand like why they are rejected or or accepted. So that 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 helps. I don't see like much problem in that. That yeah. like fights against like against the corruption. And yeah, well, some some places in Cyrus are corrupted. So yeah, it kind of brings transparency at least to the process. And also, as you mentioned, someone can learn how to do these things, right? So I think it's also useful. Uh, and, and maybe it, it uh, prevents situations when the paper is rejected outright because the uh, reviewer has some bias against this topic or, you know, I mean, at least transparency is good, I think. Yeah. 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 Are you publishing today, by the way? Do, do you have any publishable work? Do you intend to publish? Uh not much so i'm working mostly on production like maybe next year i'll work on something publishable uh yeah last last thing i published that was in samsung so for on pose estimation yeah but like i've noticed like you are very active on hnsw github like when i when i posted my question and maybe we can discuss that as well if 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 you are kind of curious on that um kind of you responded really fast and uh so it means that you still continue to allocate chunk of your time to to look at uh, you know issues and pull requests on on, on GitHub. Uh, yes, so like uh, I, I wish I I, I I I I would have done it better. <laughs> so I missed some some things from there. But yeah, I, I tried to uh, update this library. So I think that. Uh, well, when I designed the HNSW, so there were some design decisions. And uh, even if I see like some algorithms outside improve upon that, I, I, I think they are not aligned with the design. So, and I skip them. One of that is uh, like HNSW tries to avoid a global view of the network. So, because it's, it's a descendant of uh, uh, distributed algorithms. So like it's like it's not good strategically if you have like a global view. Well, sometimes it helps. Like uh, there, there are papers uh, where, where like where you can in, that we should make that uh, the path from the entry point of the network to every node is in short, so you can make it. But that is that breaks if you do insertions, for instance. Mm -hmm. So like you cannot have a global view and dynamic nature at the same time yeah so that that that's why i ignore some of the stuff 
there's also a focus on uh, like custom distances. So like, even though the HNSW lib supports only three distances, it's pretty easy to implement what distances like you want. And uh, I, I believe that uh, there will be a shift in like what distances are being used after some time because uh, there are problems with uh, like those like with those simple distances you mean like cosine uh, cosine dot product this type of distances right or yeah yeah it's more a problem that uh, you want to embed everything like you, you you want to embed an entity into a single vector representation so and that has limitations like as you like probably know that uh, like uh, transformers are based on attention and there, before there was a, uh, like LSTM with attention for translation and without attention it didn't work well because it like compressed everything to a single vector. So I, I, I believe that in some time there will be at least set distances. So where your object and query represented as a set of, like as a set of which can be shuffled and doesn't change the structure. So for a user that can be like set of user interests for a document that can be a set of like subjects inside the document and for the query yeah it can be like different parts that you want to have in the query at the same time but those parts like might not be ordered and uh, when you embed something uh, you you are you, that that you make it ordered and uh, like for instance when i uh, played this clip so there is uh, this popular. So I thought that like it, it can do OCR, which is nice. So you can uh, like have an image and uh, like see like what are the words are, 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 are which text is closest, but uh, definitely struggles with the notion of like what words are there. So what is the first word? Yeah, yeah. So like geometrically or like in different languages, it might be even different geometry of words, right? Like should you read left to right or right to left? And then like, in, you also need another dimension of language there, I guess. Yeah, or you can represent it as a like bag, bag of words, maybe ordered bag of words with some encoding as uh, all people do now for text. But that, that I think, so I think uh, like uh, ANN would need to adapt for the situation in the future and uh, keeping this ability to, uh, add new distances is uh, like is important yeah nice so, so are you are you working on on this personally or are you like welcoming pull requests as they say you know to implement different distances uh well i'm welcoming pull requests for sure because uh, those are very application specific well it, it's pretty easy to implement uh, like i don't know uh or some simple distance. So if you have like a set, a sets of distance, you just select which are the closest out of the set. So you do like many, many to many. Somewhat similar, I think, to what Colbert does. So uh, though they, they can, I think, go without it. But essentially, you'll, you'll need a set to set distance. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. I, I was, uh, since I mentioned it twice already, I was wondering like to pick your brain on, on what I was thinking in this space, like, and, 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 and trust me, it's absolutely si very simple algorithm that I came up with. Uh, the only problem is that I chose Python as the language. And so Python has this a little bit weird virtual machine, uh, kind of uh, how it does the garbage collection. And so, uh, what, I, I suspect maybe it's also a bug in my code, but on billion nodes, I cannot actually make it converge in reasonable memory. So it's like 120 gigabyte memory machine. And so it runs out of memory, like on 995th uh, million. <laughs> and um, what, what I did, I was really what, like I, I took the input set of points, right? And so the points are like 128 dimensions or 200 dimensions. And um, so essentially I pick a random point, the first one, not, not random, the first one. And then I, on a sample of points, I compute a median distance, right? So basically what's, what's the kind of average distance be between all of them in a pairwise fashion. And, um, and so then I use that as, as a filter to build what I called a shard, right? So essentially I decided to split the billion points down to 
controllable number of shards, let's say 1000 shards, right? And so I pick the first point and then I say, okay, which other point is close enough? So like within that median distance to this point. And so I, I join them together in the shard. And as the shard reaches 1 million, so basically if it's like 1000 shards, each shard roughly 1 million points, that's a billion points, right? And um, then I will close that shard and I will run HNSW on it so that I can actually have that shard as a hierarchical navigable small world graph. Um, and, and it seems to converge, like at least on 10 million, it converges, on 100 million, it converges. It runs out of memory on 1 billion, but I think it's just some weirdness in how I do it in this big loop or over all points. Um, but when I reached out to you on, on GitHub, like um, my idea was to, to also access the first layer of the graph. So that first layer where the query will enter, um, I could use that um, as the sort of um, entry point across this thousand shards, right? So be because I don't want to load all 1000 into memory. I want to load only sufficient amount of entry points so that I can quickly check which shard is closer to my query and then go inside that and use HNSW. What, what do you think about this idea? It's very simple, I think. Uh, yes. Well, th that 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 makes sense. So uh, the clustering it seems to be so like you did the you have like you cluster the points into one thousand clusters. Uh, and then uh, you select the clusters and uh, well, yeah, that, that makes sense. I think uh, like historically uh, there were other papers that uh, suggested something similar to, uh, and then I think in FLAM, so that was one of the distributed strategies that they suggested. Uh, yeah, well, that, that, that might work. At, uh, so that though that depends on on the scale, so and uh, so in, it, that also well for production system you also want to replicate those nodes and uh, so right uh, okay maybe uh, like uh, let's come from a different way so the, uh, you can also shard to very small pieces. So it might not be needed in this case, like you want to balance. So, but on the top layer, you can also use like uh, as a, in this Microsoft paper that you've mentioned, also there are other papers like from Yandex who had a paper, just those guys. So you can use, uh, uh, in, you can shard into, well, maybe not, suppose the shard, you can uh, uh, divide your data set into like million clusters and use a, like a higher, index to decide on which shard you want to select it right yes so that it, though, though like if you're if you're not talking about like uh trillion scale so it probably like doesn't make too much sense but yeah yeah you can, you can do this yeah i mean sure. i'm still hopeful to kind of keep trying it i have another friend uh, who is like on Twitter, he, he actually recorded like a YouTube video where he said, here, here, and here, you make a mistake. Like, uh, this is why you lose memory. Like you should never allocate objects inside loops. You should pre-allocate them as NumPy arrays and so on. And still with his modifications, it still runs out of memory. So like, I need to kind of move forward and I'm still kind of like, hopeful I can do it in Python, but uh, something also tells me maybe I should move to more kind of memory controllable language, something like Rust or C++, I don't know. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure. So like, uh, so using something like, uh, so you, you're probably using C++ libraries from Python, like NumPy or Torch, yeah, something like that. So they should not leak memory. So those are pretty, pretty controllable. Yeah, yeah, it, it's definitely my code. Somewhere in the loop, it it probably just computes too many times. Like, like basically, the hottest part of the algorithm, like in terms of profiling it, right, is like when you can. So you pre-compute the median distance once, right, and then you use that value all the time. So it's kind of it's okay. It's just an object. 
uh, so it doesn't allocate much. But then as you extract the next batch of points, so I read the, the 1 billion set in 1 million batches, right? Um, I sense that there could be a loss of memory because like it's a binary file. And so you say in NumPy, you say from this file, read the next uh, batch, right? So like you, you provide the kind of offset. And so I sense that maybe there it loses memory, maybe not, I don't know. Um, because I've noticed that in Fire's library, they use mmap to do the same thing. I'm not using mmap. Uh yeah, we can also use a map. So NumPy, uh, if you read the tensors from NumPy, they can also have memmap options. So you can load with memmap in NumPy. Uh, but even like uh, if you are using, if you are reading via like open, like open file with uh, like read binary, it should not leak memory. Right. So it should, it should, it should. You do read and it, it, it's just like, yeah, so it, it, it must be something su super stupid then in my code that it's kind of like really obvious to somebody like you, like, okay, here is the, here is that point, you should not do this. But like, for me, it's like I invented this basic idea, but then like pushing it, maybe like, like it works on 10 million and I'm okay, but like the task was as part of this challenge to do the billion scale, right? So this is like, you crawl, you crawl the, the mountain, without the top in a way but yes there is a top of course it's only one billion points um but yeah i mean it keeps me quite excited to keep doing it um of course i already see some uh maybe uh need for improvements for example how how do i make updates right so let's say a new point comes in and i have like 1000 charts predefined so i need to find either an existing shard or create a new one at some point so that that, that part i defer to the future but like Maybe I still need to push push harder to <laughs> just converge it first. Okay, uh, you can profile for memory, so we can like loop some operations in the code that you think that can leak and uh, profile the memory for for those. Yeah, I've been doing that. Like, actually, I also come from the world of Java, so in Java, it's like. Uh, quite straightforward in a way. There are also tools in Python. When you plug in this memory profiler, it slows down your computation significantly. And so you have to wait like 10 times more <laughs> to, to uh, see the, the, yeah, the final I, table. Yeah. So I, I'm not a fan of profilers. So like recently I, find, I, I found uh, a video, like a, a talk on YouTube, which explained uh, like why, why we shouldn't use profilers. And that was like the profilers, uh, they become obsolete when the code became uh, like not multi-threaded, but like with multiple paths. So when uh, Intel released Pentium, so Pentium is super scalar. So your operations are out of order. And uh, when you look at the profiler results, like I, I don't understand them. So when I mm -hmm. was developing HNSW Lib, I haven't used profilers. So I just like wrote benches for operations. And uh, like I had like baseline and trial, so they usually work in the same memory, so the like index is the same, but there are different implementations of search. Mm -hmm. And uh, like your your speed can depend on memory, how you allocate the memory, and uh, with those benches you can measure something like up to one or two percent of difference. And when you like uh, do a lot of benches with one or two percent improvement, you can get like twenty percent improvement, fifty percent improvement. Uh, yeah, but uh, like I never used profiles, and right. uh, like I never saw like in my life that people use profiles and like get really complicated insights from using profiles. Yeah, I agree. Like we we did like um, so we were building also like, building a search engine with like we had like by design we had like billions of documents and each document was just a short sentence like a statement from a document real document and of course we were running out like we were running into all this garbage collector stop the world problems and so on and we were running these profilers i think one of them was j rocket and and then others and like when you see the graphs you're like okay so, so now i know yes it leaks but what should i do <laughs> So, or it tells you that your code is using like byte arrays too much. Like, what can you do other than that, right? Yeah, and for performance, it's, it's even worse. So you see that like this model takes a lot of time, but uh, 
like the in a multi multi threaded world that like it's not for sure. So you yeah. may improve it, but like and that happened so quite 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 a few times. So people went went to me and said like your 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 an, uh, analysis of performance contradicts our uh, profile blogs. Right. <laughs> and that's okay right <laughs> because you didn't optimize for the profiler <laughs> yeah because profiler cannot like uh, so it cannot say to you what would happen if you change something exactly so it's, it's like it's so just observational yeah it's just a snapshot yeah exactly and and, and like coming back to hnsw what, what what are you hoping to achieve like maybe in some midterm future for example like um widely cited uh, work uh, which where they re-implement the HNSW is when they add symbolic filtering. So like, what would it take in your original paper, in your original algorithm to add symbolic filters? How does it change the dynamic of that graph and search? Uh, well, it, se it seems like for me, like, uh, so I can correlate interest to NN and interest to symbolic filtering. So like, I think, uh, Two years ago, I, I haven't heard like people talk about symbolic filtering in ANN, but now like it's a hot topic, like from different places, people want symbolic filtering. And that is like for targeting. So like for ads, yeah, you can, you want to have some targeting for the audience or some other filters. And, uh, but I see that as uh, outside of the ANN itself. So, uh, as I said, so when working on a startup, so our first application was uh, doing something like symbolic filtering. And there it's uh, easier in some sense because uh, like, as you said, there is a problem of this distances in high dimensional space. And this problem, there is no such problem in symbolic filtering. So in symbolic filtering, you have a query that have exact result. And uh, yeah. like if you write the SQL query, so it can be optimized to work efficiently and but the INN does a very different job it does approximate yeah filtering you can kind of uh, mix them together so if you add like uh, so you have a distance and uh, like you add some like prefix for that which somehow captures the symbolic filtering and you can build an index that also like takes uh, takes account and like there are some other people who suggested to do that as well. Uh, but the problem here, like, and yeah, that can help. So during search, so if you filter by the symbol and uh, like you can easily add filtering. So in HNSW does filtering for deletes, like it can be done the same way. Uh, yeah, you can extract like uh, on, only elements that pass the filter and there is some like guidance on the graph because you create it with it. But for me, like, I don't know. So you have like huge number of possible filters. So what will be the metric and how would you balance it with the like approximate net network that creates a lot of problems, right. I think. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I thought that the best solution would be like to keep this, but like to some extent, uh, but focus more on like, how do you can chart the index according to those uh, like, uh, Criteria, those criteria are sharp, so you can like do SQL queries. Like for instance, uh, like there are some queries that can uh, work well with this filtering. Uh, like if you most of like or like I don't know twenty percent of the elements pass the symbolic filter, so that is fine. You can use it, but maybe there are some queries for which like I don't know only like one of a million passes them, and th those are in different parts. Yeah, exactly. Of, uh, space. Mm -hmm. So for them, you can uh, see in real time. So you uh, like you search and you see that it doesn't perform well uh, for uh, those. And you can just build a separate index for them. Right. Because you know, those are small. Those are people want to find them. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there are enough. Maybe they're out of a million. But if you have trillion of elements, so there's like a million of them. So you, you, you cache them, like build a cache index for those on the fly. So that is like discrete optimization problem. And yeah. I think that's a bit outside of the index because index is like, uh, yeah, so it's focused on a different part. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I clearly I don't think that other algorithms like NN algorithms can uh, like somehow avoid this problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean it sounds. Uh, yeah, what what you say like if I understand correctly, it's like a little bit like ANN contradicts uh, this kind of the, the nature of symbolic filtering in some sense, but still people do it, right? So for example, in VAV8 and in Quadrant, they did it, right? So like you, and in Milbus as well, but it's funny, like in Milbus, they use um, FIES and then other algorithms, right? But they say, we only support, you know, integer uh, fields, but we don't support, for example, strings yet. So we are working on adding strings, which means, Essentially, they're designing like um, this graph somehow in such a way that, okay, it doesn't support strings yet, maybe because it's not so easy to, 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 to add it, right? Uh, well, I, 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 I'm not sure. So that also depends how you measure the performance. Like if you have rare queries uh, that, which, which don't have a, a, any result, so like, you prob like your algorithm doesn't even work on them. But you, if they are rare, so you, you measure the like overall recall and you don't see like any problems. So definitely you can build a solution, maybe like some simple with like filtering during search, but uh, like it's sure it will fail uh, on some points and that is suboptimal in terms of latency. Yeah. So exactly. if, you, if you talk about uh, existing solution, may, maybe they have like a really good solution, which I just don't know. I looked at few, uh, and that was uh, mostly like filtering inside the graph. So, yeah. like if you yeah. if you if you if you have uh, really rare elements which are like distributed across the search space, evenly like in different parts, so it will struggle because right. you need to just do brute force of the whole to find yeah. them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to me, it sounds like combinatorial explosion. Like if I add more and more symbolic filters. Like essentially I'm introducing like new subspaces in my space, right? So like I need to like push these points somehow closer to each other within that specific symbolic filter. But if I add more of them, now I have like the <laughs> kind of like multi-dimensional space of filters, right? Uh, yeah, and uh, you, you, you have a really high dimensional space of filters, but you don't really know like the, the distribution of queries for those filters, it, it should be very different because those are user distribution. Yeah. So that also will uh, make the problem more complicated. So it still can work, if you, if the, especially if distribution is kind of similar. So mm -hmm. it, it will work if you crank up the parameters of the graph, uh, yeah, use more connections. But uh, so there is a mismatch. So during query, your distribution might be very different. And you need to think about it. So like how you balance those inside. So you have like two types of distance and how you balance them. You want to balance it so the the, the query yeah. distribution. Yeah. Does 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 this field like I think this field of vector search does it make you excited that you you contributed to it? Like how how do you feel about this field that is emerging right now? Well, I think it is very important. So right now I'm working mostly on applications. So how to uh, like get advantage of this and uh, so there are many applications uh, which cannot be done without efficient search like there was a paper for DeepMind, like was quite recently that where they used search uh like inside inside of the network and uh, well that makes a lot of sense so and i think uh, yeah there will be more papers and there were papers before that paper but there will be more papers that use ANN inside the inside a B, like a huge NLP model. Yeah, yeah. For example, like this uh, learning to hash methods. I don't know if you heard about them. So like um, there are like when I when I try to kind of uh, put everything into their buckets, like how, how many different types of algorithms exist. Like I didn't know about learning to hash. It seems to be like one of the recent uh, developments. Are you following up on that as well or? uh well learning to hash so like i'm not really following that so learning to hash uh, was before hnsw okay like there were algorithms and uh when i talked with people who did like what specialize on product quantization and review the papers uh they told me that like learning to hash never reaches the performance of like 
post quantization. Like at least at the, that was a, like a few years ago. Yeah. And uh, yeah, maybe like now it's solved. Uh, but uh, like when I talk about ANN inside, the, I, I think more like about graph ANN. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and uh, so one interesting thing that also can happen uh, like with graphs. So what what is like what is the additional advantage of graph uh, nearest neighbor search engines is that you can change the metric. Uh, so, for instance, if you are doing multi-stage ranking, like the you have, have like and you have multi multiple candidate sources, like for search you have something like like BM twenty five, and also you might have embeddings like with similarity search. So, uh, and those are like treated as separate sources and then ranked. Uh, but essentially, like, why do you need ANN? Like, for the first, like, from, from the beginning, uh, you need ANN to speed up the ranking. So, essentially, you can rank all the documents using your have a ranker, uh, but uh, you cannot. It's too, like, too expensive to do. So, you can add ANN. And ANN is basically for vector search. Uh, that is, you distill everything to vectors and you have the same objective. And uh, you have like a, a like a way to uh, sparsify the interactions, uh, but you can look about it the other way. So you now you have a graph, and the graph are just the candidates, and uh, you have like a low uh, simple metric. Now you have a more complicated metric on this graph, and you have like a final ranker that also can be searched on this graph. So uh, that means you don't supply. Uh, like a set of candidates to the ranker, but rather you supply interpoints in the graphs. So you have a graph, which is uh, well, which uh, is built uh, trying to uh, capture the uh, similarity for the ranker. Mm -hmm. And uh, like when you, uh, so instead of filtering like from one stage to the next stage, you can uh, just switch the metric in the graph. You had light metric, which is like vectors. Now you have a more complicated metrics, so you hydrate the features of the elements in the graph and like traverse mm -hmm. and like now, now you have a really complicated metric, which yeah. is like very heavy, but you still you just have an interpoint in the graph. So you explore it and you can uh well you can fix some mistakes done by the previous layers. Yeah. So it's not exact filtering. So that's yeah, that's another like uh maybe unique uh feature of the graph methods yeah it sounds quite exciting like have you have you thought about publishing this idea or like i mean it's, it sounds quite quite unique well it does not make sense to publish an idea without implementation <laughs> yeah for sure but maybe you can influence um those who who would like to uh experiment on it um at least those who will watch this podcast i think they will or listen they will they will probably pick it up yeah, and use graph algorithms for social as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it sounds like all all of the NN algorithms they have w like advantages and disadvantages, right? So it's not like the all of them are uniquely outperforming, you know, the others. Well, there is like a division. Like if you think about uh, like quantization algorithms, so they are kind of orthogonal to graph algorithms. So they they quantize so they can speed up the compress like I'm compressed to save the memory and speed up the computation. Uh, but uh, like older algorithm, they just use something like IVF. So uh, and that is like one layer filtering, and uh, you can use graphs instead of IVF. Right. So we can use graphs and uh, add the uh, quantization. And uh, Faiz did that before. Yeah. And I think yeah. some others also did that. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing, and then like vector databases actually offer it as one method, like um, like Milvus, for example, like they offer IVF, and then you can choose like if you want to do exact KNN or if you want to do ANN, so you can actually configure it in different ways. Um, yeah, I mean, it just sounds like you're without maybe realizing much, like you are at the core of what's happening in vector search in some sense. Of course, there there have been other multiple contributions, right? But like for some reason exactly your algorithm has been picked by many vector databases there are like seven of them so i actually wrote a blog about 
six of them and then seventh kind of knocked on my door and said can you also add add us <laughs> and so when i when i was going through different databases like in java implemented in java or in in python or you know in rust and go all of them picked your algorithm for some reason so like um may, maybe it was easier like it's a combination of how easy it is to implement how transparent it is like to understand right and then basically it's stability so it's like a combination of things yeah probably like i, I i'm not totally sure so uh, yeah the initial library also was uh, implemented as a header on the, well not the initial so that was a second library so uh, there, there was a problem with uh, HNSW lib implementation and uh, NMS lib. So it uh, so like the NMS lib format was a bit restrictive, like for efficient operations. So it converted it to a flat memory format, and uh, so that 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 makes made con construction slower and memory consumption bigger. So it was re-implemented as a header only library. So header only library was inspired by Annoy. So, like by the success also, and uh, I, I think that also might have contributed because it's very easy to like integrate it. So there are a few files it compiles in some seconds. Yeah. So maybe maybe also that helped. So the the library itself is simple and easy to integrate. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it must feel kind of cool to to have this impact uh, but but i also i also hope like you 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 will continue kind of maybe doing some publishable publishable work in some fashion it doesn't need to be a journal which is rejected five times but something else is this something that you are planning to do or uh well that depends so like i cannot talk too much about my work in twitter so uh so uh, maybe maybe we will publish something. So that 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 depends on how it goes. I, I mean, in near in the nearest neighbor search. Yeah. Not not only, but yeah. So, but I, I it's hard it's hard to predict now. If it if it works well, so then 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 we we'll publish. Yeah, at least the, the idea that you mentioned, like I mean, if you if it's outside Twitter, for example, in HNSW library, like the idea of this multi-stage ranking sounds quite exciting. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I think it can be implemented only by the teams who own the rankers and uh, own the whole pipeline. Yeah, that's so true. I, I don't think it can be implemented as a like a. As because a you need to hide. hide yeah, you need to hydrate the features and uh, like yeah. uh, on the fly and feature hydration is very specific to application yeah so it can yeah. be done only inside the production environment yeah that makes sense yeah uh, so may maybe it will call for creation of data sets and kind of this benchmarks if the industry chooses to move in that direction well like uh, there are some obvious problems with data privacy with that so it's hard to publish something well you can think of a toy problem so like you have a, like you don't do actual like work with users but maybe uh, you do image to image search and you have like a huge transformer model on top of that or maybe like something like marco ms marco maybe it can be done with that like experimented maybe so yeah yeah, um, I think we went really deep today, Yuri. I think it was really, really cool, cool talking to you. I, I always like to still ask um, kind of this question, orthogonal question of why. Like, uh, it's a little bit more philosophical, but like, if you're not averse uh, of philosophy, like, uh, wh why would you say, like, this field attracted you, like, in your own words? Uh, like... I didn't have much choice. It just was like I, I got I got my first job offer, and that was uh, in in this field. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's about scale. So like people like scaling, and like many games when you play on like Android or other stuff, they're based on scaling. So you do like a little action, and there are like huge consequences of those actions, like destroying something or like and that is scaling. And uh, this is just like a pure scale of how, how, how do you scale machine learning applications. 
Yeah. So on, on one hand, it kind of was predefined, as you said, you found the job. On the other hand, you still were curious to implement that algorithm. So like, it wasn't like somebody said, okay, you have to do it, right? You could also choose a job of like, okay, I'm just coding nine to five and then I go home. <laughs> but like, you still decided to implement an algorithm. Well, yes. Well, that, that was a fun job. So yeah so like you were not scared by the challenge itself right maybe was it was it like motivating actually uh there was no like that much push like for from the like for, from the company itself so we could we, we could do whatever we want inside the company so it was very like relaxed yeah uh, that might be actually a really good background to invent things don't, don't you think like if, if you if you come to work and somebody says no you cannot do what you want you should do this and it might be kind of too restrictive but here like there have been both challenges and also that freedom to solve those challenges uh, yeah there are like two components first of all you need to have like uh, freedom and uh, do long long term stuff so like without worrying of, of like what are you going to ship into production. So the second is concentration of talent. So you need yeah. to have like a high concentration of talent so people can share ideas. And yeah. if you have this mix, so like there will there, there will be innovations for sure. Yeah, it sounds like you had a combination of all three components that you mentioned, right? So like talents and also, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I also saw that in other companies like yeah, like in Samsung, there was a really strong team and there was like lots of innovation. So there are a few startups uh, which came from our lab and there was a, like a really good paper. Yeah, so that, that, that's, a, that, that's a recipe for innovation for sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm really happy that it turned out so well to you, for you and um, your co-author as well. I think he continues to work also in the industry, at least last time I checked. Um, and so I, I, I really hope that uh, you will get some really cool pull requests on HNSW that will pass your criteria. <laughs> well, yeah, most of them pass. It's just uh, like, I, 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 I would love to have more time and I'll try to allocate more time uh, yeah. looking and checking them. Yeah, it's really, really great. I really enjoyed talking to you, Yuri. Um, thanks so much for allocating your time also in this pre-Christmas time. Um, but yeah, I mean, all the best to you in, in the future. Also Twitter and uh, ho hope, hope to see some published work at some point. But I, I, I don't know. It's just uh, I enjoyed reading your paper and, and uh, kind of also then read, read your code. And it's kind of like... It feels like you've put a lot of effort there, and and it uh, it also influences the industry so much today. So maybe you are not kind of realizing this every single day, but like, uh, yeah, you should know this that there are so many databases that use your algorithm as as one of the baselines in production. It's really cool work. Yeah, yeah, that that's that 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 is great. That there was success. Yeah, maybe one thing that like I would note uh, that the idea with the rankers, so that was partially implemented in Leonid's work. So he had a work on ER, maybe you know, like uh, like using the uh, and then as the for the final ranker. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's just like so I, I felt that I need to cite this. Sure, like Leonid's work. For sure, I, I I learned this idea like maybe not with changing, but from from him. Yeah, yeah, it sounds great. I mean, I, I've also interacted a bit with him, uh, and and it sounds like he's a very knowledgeable guy, and he has very strong opinions as well. So maybe we will also talk with him on one of the episodes. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I'm glad that uh, you guys collaborated, and uh, yeah, it's it's a fantastic result for for the industry as well, um, and and probably for your profiles. Well, not probably, but definitely for your profiles. Um, so yeah, um, thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, I hope you will have a relaxing time over the Christmas and uh, happy new year as well. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time, Yuri. Thank you, you too. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye.